I think with social media, because tech companies will not take responsibility for what they built, we are at a crossroads as a society where we now have two wars raging. The United States cannot even provide aid or act in any way because we lack a speaker. And the priority should be national security, of which social media is such an open vector for hate, harassment, and incitement that our national security is now at... uh, 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 It's now nearly impossible to roll back the clock and try to figure out, well, who online is real and who online is uh, an imposter. Hello and welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today we're continuing our series of Beyond Belief, looking at the essential role that information plays in the functioning of our democracy. We are honored to have two guest speakers today, both remarkable in their field, both leaders in the world of social media, memes, disinformation, and general fake news research. Each has written a book on a key aspect of the current information circus. Lee McIntyre is author of On Disinformation, How to Fight for Truth and Protect Democracy. He's a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and the History of Science at Boston University. Joan Donovan is an assistant professor of journalism and emerging media studies. She's also at Boston University. Donovan leads the field in examining internet and technology studies, online extremism, and media manipulation. She's founder of the Critical Internet Studies Institute, a nonprofit that advocates for public interest internet, and she's co-author of Meme Wars, the untold story of the online battles upending democracy in America. Well, welcome to you both. Thank you very much. Great to see you. Great to see you both. So this is an enormous topic and it seems to grow in weight and uh, content by the hour. So let's go to it. Uh, You both know a lot about this subject. Um, I invite you to come in as often as you like to fill in the blanks for the audience. So let me start with you, Lee. Your new book, this little uh, pocket guide on disinformation, uh, is full of facts about our current information ecosystem. And it offers some solid advice about how citizens can gird themselves for the coming battle against truth. We now find ourselves in a fake news universe and we're approaching an election in 2024 with some candidates already touting anti-vax disinformation and stolen election nonsense as part of their platform. You say that Trump's propaganda tactics and dirty tricks aren't new. And in fact, they're a century old, which is true. But back then they didn't have the internet. So as proof, you also cite a study which says 65% of the anti-vax propaganda on Twitter was due to just 12 people. This came from the Center for Countering Digital Hate. So, Lee, give us a quick brief history of these political tactics and what do we do to curtail this kind of spreading of disinformation? Yeah, Uh, well, for one thing, it's not the coming war on truth. It's here and it's been here for uh, quite some time. Um, The difference between 100 years ago and now is amplification. Um, modern disinformation warfare was invented in Russia in the 1920s. Um, Lenin's first director of the Cheka uh, was uh, Dzerzhensky, Felix Dzerzhensky. And this was uh, a means of uh, psychological warfare, manipulation, you know, a way to win um, a war without bullets, uh, you know, when you didn't have the, the bullets. And it it involved, you know, understanding cognitive bias, propaganda, you know, how to um, use the you know techniques of mental manipulation, and this went 
through the Soviet era uh, and, uh, you know, then to the Russian era again and today. And so, I mean, many nations use this. Many people use disinformation tactics. Putin certainly does. And, you know, he understands this very well as a former KGB officer. But some of these tactics are, you know, quite old uh, and not necessarily well known, though. I mean, you do hear people talking about uh, the fire hose of falsehood or what about ism, things like this, that are, you know, Russian disinformation tactics that are now in common use. But as you say, the difference today is amplification. Because it used to be that, you know, I mean, lying is as, as old as maybe human speech. But what happens now is that disinformation is shared uh, widely. Uh, it, you know, it, it, any any liar who has a microphone can share disinformation, as we, you know, we can see on social media. There's another important aspect in the modern era. Not only can we broadcast disinformation, we can narrowcast it. So you see micro-targeting. Uh, you know, look at the tools that marketers use for Facebook to sell, you know, cosmetics or sneakers, or that, you know, the terrorist organizations use to recruit new members. You can use those same ones for dis disinformation. You can find exactly the audience that you want to hear your message and try to radicalize them into deniers, which is, you know, what happens these days around issues like vaccines or climate change or um, the allegedly stolen uh, 2020 elections. So, you know, this is a well-worn path um, that, you know, goes from the uh, Russian era uh, to today. Um, one of the most important parts of the path is what happened with science denial in the 1950s and then, you know, up through today, which is that they started to use some of these tactics to get people to doubt whether cigarette smoking caused cancer, whether vaccines were safe, whether climate change was real. This is all in Naomi Ureska's uh, book, Merchants of Doubt. And now it's become reality denial. Now we're just denying any sort of facts that we want, not just for profit, but for political, the purpose of political power. What to do about it? Um, fight back. I mean, we're in an information war and you don't win an information war by putting your head in the sand. You have to mark uh, the fact that we are actually in an information war, that this is intentional, that there are people behind these lies, that this is not misinformation, it's disinformation, uh, which is to say that it's not an accident, it's a lie. And that's the first uh, salvo in fighting back. So differentiate, so dis is deliberate yes. and mis can be just sending on stuff that's wrong and you don't even know it's wrong. So you're furthering yeah. misinformation. T it's not necessarily, uh, it, it's the motive that's different, is it? Yeah, technically speaking, misinformation is merely false information and the person sharing it uh, can, you know, believe that it's that it's true, not, even though it's false. Disinformation is, as I said, a lie. Disinformation is intentionally false information that's shared by the person who created it for a couple of purposes. One is to try to get you to believe a falsehood. But the second is when you, uh, is the second goal of disinformation, I think, is to get you to become polarized around a factual issue, which is to say disinformation is polarizing in a way that misinformation maybe isn't. Because if it's misinformation, you might learn the facts and change your mind. With disinformation, they're grooming you to hate people who don't believe the same falsehood that you do. They're creating teams, us versus them, you know, hate, distrust the people on the other side. That's why it's so dangerous, because it doesn't just tell you something false. It cuts you off from the source to correct uh, what, you know, what's true. So, Joan, let's let's move over to you. Welcome. Um, your book, uh, Meme Wars, was was very informative for me because, um, you know, it's a whole new world to me understanding this. So first of all, you rewind the clock politically sort of over the past 10 years to map the rise of memes as weapons to push disinformation, as Lee said, spread ideology and deepen division. So what is a meme and how did these slogans uh, jump, as you say, from the wires to the weeds with things like stop the steal? So you get something that's, that's a, a buzz thing on the internet and then it suddenly this broad club of discontent 
uh, are organized and herded into an insurrection movement. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you for having me, Mary and Lee. Congratulations on the book coming out and hey to everybody in the GBH family. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, so I we decided to write about memes and internet culture because we wanted people, gen, normal folks, everyday folks that use the internet it wasn't an appeal to policymakers or or, you know, people in positions of power, we wanted people to understand the everyday conditions of communication and how social media is changing politics. And politics changes how technology works as well, but we are facing this really strange moment where political campaigns are adopting uh, information warfare tactics, as well as uh sticky memes that are usually pretty popular amongst Gen Z or um uh millennials and internet memes became very popular over the last let's say 15 20 years of the internet because they're very similar to advertising in the sense that they might have a jingle or a slogan or an image that's a reference to pop culture. They usually appeal to certain in-groups and out-groups. So if you're a librarian, for instance, you might share memes with other librarians about, you know, saying shush in the library or, or something like that. Or if you're a military vet, there there are lots and lots of military vet memes and and it's a way for you to signal to other folks in that subculture that you are part of it and that you get it and so memes became this universal language online as a way to point out irony as entertainment think about lol cats or you know all the different cat memes over the years but what we really wanted to look at was beginning with Occupy Wall Street, this moment of internet memes really pushing protest movements and then how they became adopted by political campaigns. And we had seen great books out there about Obama and his hope and change agenda. And you can imagine the the hope poster from 2012 with Shepard Ferry was a big meme for the left. A uh, phrase like Black Lives Matter is probably the meme of the decade in terms of how much information just that three word phrase encapsulates. Um, but in order to tell the more sinister side of memes, we wanted to go back and look at how they became important amongst subcultures that do have a presence offline as well. So we don't look at Occupy from the leftist or anarchist agenda, but we look at it from who was there, Alex Jones, uh, Breitbart, Steve Bannon. What did they learn from Occupy? How was Alex Jones pushing and the Fed and, and uh, other kinds of memes like um, New World Order at that time? How did that connect into Ron Paul and other kinds of Republican politic. And then we go through all of these different iterations of right wing memes and how these different subcultures online interact with each other. And so it doesn't tell a unified story of the right. It actually tells a very splintered and fractured history of how all these different groups were struggling over um the right to define the situation they were struggling over control in the party and then enters in a chaos agent like donald trump with once he hooked up with steve bannon uh in roger stone it was very clear that he was going to have a very um uh let's say notorious internet campaign in 2016 and then you saw the memes constant, lock her up, stop the steal, build the wall. Time and time again, he was he was doing this, you know, even send them back. And um, and he was very good at it. MAGA, even make America great again, which became this uh, statement, which 
on the surface, Trump was really trying to pull on kinds of nostalgia for an America where Black people didn't have rights, gay people didn't have rights, women didn't have the same kind of um, jobs that they have now. He was really trying to harken back to a time when what we would say the forgotten man or the average white male American was uh, revered. And so it was no surprise that people read Make America Great Again as Make America White Again. And there was this big battle over trying to just say what was really happening. And I think, Lee, you know, you could probably elaborate more on this, but the idea of not being able to speak the truth, saying things like racially tinged instead of saying racist, uh, not being able to call Trump out on the lies because there were so many and they were so sometimes so minor and sometimes so major but it was so confusing because you're arguing with this person who is lying to you to gaslight you knows it's going to set the media agenda on center media like on the mainstream media you know he's at it again what is he saying now um and he used that to his advantage to drive quite a large wedge through not just the American left, but also through the Republican Party. And that's what you're seeing in struggles like today, trying to get a speaker, is that Trump is still shadow managing the Republican Party. And we show particularly how this happens through the ways in which he uses technology, the the kinds of people he brings into his campaign. And then, of course, um, the book ends with Stop the Steal and the Day of the Insurrection. That's a lot of information there, a mm -hmm. lot. So uh, one of the things that you also pointed out in the book was that first of all, you said the right are much better at using the internet than the left because they co-opt memes and hashtags and they flip and confuse and even reverse meanings on things. And and you talked about, this is way before, but the history of the, the Uncle Sam, mm -hmm. I mean, that actually started in UK, correct? Yeah, yeah. So if you think about one of the most canonical symbols of America, Uncle Sam, the poster, I want you, uh, that actually is a, a riff or a use of a an image that was very popular in the London opinion, uh, recruiting people into the service. And, and the reason why I bring up memes like this is to say that memes are all around us and advertising is the industry that decided that memes were going to be the way in which they did business. And so if you think about other slogans that we've become accustomed to, I can say, just do it. And you know what brand I'm talking about. And that kind of linguistic structure isn't necessarily particular to um, the U.S. at all, but things that have a rhyme like jobs, not mobs, um, things that you can put in an image that are evocative. We saw a lot of this around um, pushing back on Colin Kaepernick in the NFL you know, there were a lot of soldier memes and, and it says like the only time I take a knee for my country and it's a sniper on his knee, these kind of memes became very provocative. Um, and I think that expressing yourself as an individual on social media, we're there to share information. And what's unique about social media that Lee was pointing to is its capacity to polarize us. And it doesn't necessarily uh, have to be about politics. Uh, and I'll give you an example. I don't think any one of us has ever gone on social media and said, I had a mediocre dinner last night. <laughs> Thanks. Right. This spaghetti was OK. Right. We're only posting things because they're a major success or they're an abysmal disappointment. And the way that social media operates is in those lanes and in that vernacular. 
So when social media posts go viral, it's usually because they have several specific qualities. Um, in disinformation, they're usually novel and outrageous. So it's a rumor that nobody knows <laughs> and you are the only source of information on it, which is how Alex Jones kept people coming back to his program. And he would say things that were completely outrageous. So if he's the only one with this information and it's outrageous, most of us would think, well, that's crazy and we're going to walk away. But online people get sucked into it they be it becomes part of their world and the more novel and outrageous it is the more enticing it is just like at the grocery stand looking at the tabloids uh, you know I, we grew up with weekly world news and this That's was a, yeah this was a paper that often featured bat boy on the cover and nobody ever knew who bat boy was or what what that image was but it drew you in and it brought you into different worlds. And I think with social media, because tech companies will not take responsibility for what they built, we are at a crossroads as a society where we now have two wars raging. The United States cannot even provide aid or act in any way because we lack a speaker. And the priority should be national security, of which social media is such an open vector for hate, harassment, and incitement that our national security is now at, uh, 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 it, it's now nearly impossible to roll back the clock and try to figure out, well, who online is real and who online is uh, an imposter. So I wrote this piece, I threw it in the chat for Time Magazine over the weekend about how misinformation is warfare. And we're watching it play out online every day. And social media companies are not doing enough to guarantee that the important information that we're getting is true. And that I think the war on facts that Lee talks about is, is so important. Do you want to pitch in there, Lee? Yeah, I mean, Joan, the, the perspective that you outlined there is, is kind of a nice history of um, what I think of as the beginning of the post-truth era. Uh, I define post-truth as the political subordination of reality. It's when people realized that they could share information that not only was false and could convince people, you know, that it was true, but it would it could, in a way almost change our relationship to reality, right? Because ultimately in a such a polluted information environment, you know, a propagandistic environment, somebody might say that, you know, it, it affects us whether we believe it or not, because we're, we have to live in a culture in which, you know, the Congress doesn't work, uh, you know, in, in which, you know, our airwaves are, you know, taken over with these uh, uh, fake issues. Um, and so it is, um, and I mean, this, this happens in, uh, you see this happen in uh, uh, totalitarian societies where people will say, well, you know, the, the dictator is asserting his power and that's real, whether what he's saying is false or not. And I think, by the way, that's what Trump was doing when he was telling all those small and large lies at the beginning of his administration. He was preparing us for the kind of president he, that he was going to be. He was asserting his power. He may, if you believed the things he was saying, his Ob his uh, uh, inauguration was bigger than Obama's or it didn't rain on his inauguration speech, all to the good. But even if you didn't believe it, his point was still made. I am so powerful that I can say false things and there's nothing that you can do about it. Not the media, not the voters, no one. And that's why I am personally worried about um, democracy. That's why the subtitle of my book is uh, how to fight for truth and protect democracy. And Joan, I know that you're worried about that too, because one thing that I uh, quote in my book is from your testimony before Congress, when you said the biggest problem facing our nation is misinformation at scale, the cost of doing nothing is democracy's end. Mm -hmm. 
and I I still feel that, you know, as we enter into a new phase of research and public awareness, you know, if we were having this conversation in 2017, you would be saying disinformation is not that big of a deal, right? Most people would, probably not, maybe not us, but a lot of people felt as if um, who would believe Macedonian teenagers anyway about election and fake news and it's all Facebook was even Zuckerberg was saying it was all blown out of proportion and and but as researchers dug in and understood the structure and design of social media was giving a first mover advantage to uh, disinformers and media manipulators who were also making money through this process um I realized that we weren't going to have a robust, uh, unified front against lies and media manipulation if we didn't train journalists, if we didn't bring policymakers to the table and have them understand how apps like Twitter and YouTube and Facebook work. It was going to take a sea change publicly. Uh, to recognize the importance of this problem. And of course, you had Democrats that were picking up uh, this research and reading it and understanding it for what it was. And then you had Republicans, in many instances, um, not care, right? For the most part, they weren't engaging. Um, And then you had some Republicans who felt like they were completely exposed, that the playbook was out there. And, uh, you know, you had people like Marjorie Taylor Greene who were exposed as QAnon supporters early on and and then used her popularity online in order to get elected. And I think as we even looked at uh, people like Paul Gosar, who infamously tweeted Epstein didn't kill himself at one point uh we started to realize that this wasn't uh one or two rogue actors but this was becoming a political strategy it's it's virulent and I mean somebody like Jim Jordan is now even fighting he's making the claim that disinformation research is dangerous that you know that 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 should be uh you know some that content moderation is dangerous etc et and and you know i question whether we get it even even now though joan you, you say that it's different 2017 than it is today because most of the news the cable news that i watch they're still confused between mis and disinformation they still routinely say misinformation when you know it's disinformation one of the differences in the last 10 days since the israel hamas war is all of a sudden you're seeing major media outlets start to use the word disinformation but even today on nicole wallace's program on msnbc which is a very good program it's one i mean she routinely draws a good distinction between mis and disinformation Today's lead story, just you know, a little bit ago, they opened with the uh, bombing of the hospital in Gaza, and you know we're showing all the Im- the bloody images and you know to doing what journalists do, saying you know the bomb fell on the hospital um, that uh, Hamas claims it was Israel and Israel denies it, and then the next thing that they did was go to an IDF colonel um, who you know said that she was angry because she had had to sit there for the last five or 10 minutes and watch them amplify a lie. And, you know, I sat up in my chair, I had to get ready for this, but I sat up in my chair to listen. And then Nicole Wallace said, can you prove that it was not Israel? And I thought, uh Oh, now, now there's, now there's trouble because, and then the IDF Colonel said, I wish I could remember her name. Um, we don't target hospitals. Now, so there's a very interesting kind of a conversation, isn't there? Because mm-hmm. you know you can't prove that it's disinformation. You can't prove that it's wrong. Yet, minutes later, Nicole Wallace 
provided the larger context and good on her that she did. She said, so let me see if I get this straight. Hamas acknowledges that they fired a rocket toward Israel. Israel acknowledged that the rocket never fell in Israel. Within that time window, a hospital in Gaza was bombed. Mm -hmm. So it was likely a misfire of a, a, a missile from Hamas that blew up the hospital. And then Hamas claimed, you know, it, maybe they didn't intentionally bomb their own hospital, but they used the occasion of their misfired missile to claim that Israel was responsible. So there's disinformation, you know, in real time on the news. And it, it's... It, it's tragic. How do, how do you, but because it gets back to that question, can you prove that it wasn't? But well, you know, it's going it, to play this back. This is taking us, it's, it's very frightening because you're piecing together the truth. Um, uh, and even even journalists are now concerned that they're not getting the, the real picture unless they're on the ground. Uh, I mean, this is just the, going back to George Orwell, um, where, you know, we're at war today, but, you know, is it Eurasia? You know, who was it yesterday? It, you could say anything. And I think we shouldn't discount the importance that Trump took for playing the innocent buffoon. It was almost a caricature of a politician. Now, I know he's not very smart. I mean, I don't think it's because he's <laughs> so sophisticated. I think he is a buffoon, but he's the perfect front for getting away with tremendously powerful things uh, talking about Im immigrants and women and blacks, he can get away with that. Uh, and he can invent these silly words uh, in a clownish way. But they're sinister. Beneath the idiocy, there's a sinister aspect to it. And I think people initially discounted that. He's a he's a clown and a buffoon, but he's also a near genius level propagandist. I mean, he, I, I, he had a lot I, of help. Yes, yeah, he, he did. did. He, did. he did. But I mean, yeah. he I, I make he in, my, in my book that he uh, instituted the first successful nationwide domestic disinformation campaign in the United States. Yeah, you said that we were a virgin That's population for this in, in Russia and China. They're they're used to this. But we here here we were. Uh, all flummoxed. Well, I think that's also doing. testament to how robust the American media is in the sense that there have been other disinformation campaigns, of course, yes. weapons of mass destruction being one yes. of them that did get over on the U.S. public and was uncovered by journalists. And we know the story now. And I would say, back to your comment, Lee, about watching the news. So here's how I watch the news. I don't believe anybody. And especially <laughs> I don't believe anybody involved in a conflict that's giving up to the minute it, you know, editorial, you know, and so I, I think about this and I think about what happened in Gaza today. And I I I have a prayer for relief and for hope and and that um people should not be killed, uh, period, uh, no matter the country. Um, but what we're witnessing right now is that play of opinions. The hope of the IDF officer is essentially that you turn the channel after this and maybe that's the information you take away and you don't take away any other information. And, and then that becomes the story for you and it crystallizes. And if you see it again and again, which memes and other kinds of information online does is it functions on this very repetitious and redundant cycle, be, you become a nerd to the truth. You be, it, it's hard to find the truth. And the truth, unfortunately, is slow and expensive. Disinformation is cheap and fast. And so when I'm watching the news, I'm listening because in terms of information, what happens in Gaza today uh, probably is not going to affect me materially, spiritually, yes, but not materially. Uh, but if it had been information about a city I was living in, I would want up to the minute information. But for most of us, we don't need information in the minute. 
And news has not, up until very recent times, worked at this time scale. We used to talk the, about the cable news networks changing the nature of news to be always on. Social media changes that 24-hour cycle to, you know, literally every minute something is happening. And you're exposed to so much more trauma and so many more atrocities than you ever would be if you just watched you know, one hour of news at the end of the day, like some people. Yeah. One story that I found endearing over the years um, is about that compulsion towards up to the minute news. And I, I was reading this book about the press. And one of the things that one tiny historical fact that has always stuck with me is the reason why we have the Sunday paper. And that's because Irish people only wanted to read all the news once a week. So they didn't want to bother with a daily paper. They said, put it all in the Sunday paper. I'll read it once a week. Right. And so there's something about our society that has changed and the opportunities now for states, private actors, marketers, influencers to um, create these narratives that are highly suspect. Um, but in a vacuum of information, we believe that. And I think that this, nothing was more poignant during uh, COVID than Trump's press briefings every night at five, where he would get up and point at the press and call them fake news and talk about maybe we can get rid of it with some kind of light inside the body, the hydroxychloroquine, um, mess that we got in all of these things because we're in a moment of fear and that information matters we're likely to take action and one of the things that a, a meme roars really looks into is this moment of moving from the wires to the weeds when does something you read online change your behavior so much so that you go out and do something different in public be it go to a protest or sign a petition or take over the Capitol. Um, so, but, you know, watching the news has been such an arduous task these days and the fog of war, I don't think even captures what we're witnessing in terms of suppression of the press, as well as inability to get information out of Gaza. Um, and then the the war that's raging that most Americans don't quite understand and that that is layered in years of disinformation about the relationship between Palestinians and Israelis. And that is a very difficult thing to untangle, given the passion and the love that people have for Israel and for that country. Um, but I would say this at the at the end of, at the end of my statement here is that i don't know if we would have the kind of worldwide support for palestinians in this moment if it wasn't for the internet right and so there are all of these things that have gone from one stage to another and scaled because of social media um but unfortunately it's really given an advantage to those that would spread lies. Okay, we've got uh, a lot of, of areas to cover. It's amazing timing that this, this discussion is actually taking place right when this conflict is erupting because it's a good demonstration of how you can have no lack. There's this huge lack of perspective and lack of context with a soundbite. It doesn't tell you anything unless you want to read up and understand the situation. So the, somebody has written a question here, and it ties into something you said, Joan, about each of us now, because of technology, is our own television station. And so our information environment has serious design flaws, you said, because there's no seatbelts on social media. So I, just before we get to that question that's come in, can you talk about that? Because I thought it was a really interesting analogy you made about the car and why seatbelts were introduced and how we haven't got the equivalent on the internet. On yeah, so when we talk about technology, 
Um, usually technology happens in a progression. One of the things we add last <laughs> are safety mechanisms. So nobody needs a seatbelt to ride, to drive a car. So why would you think immediately about building them? And the same is true about the, the internet and social media is we've now entered into a phase where we know what the harm is. We know what a car crash looks like online. Um, well, I should say we know what a train wreck looks like online too. But the issue is how are we going to build those guardrails, those seatbelts, whatever it's going to take to ensure that those who use social media to scale this information are held accountable. Um, and for a while, there was this idea that defamation laws would be used. And, and then, of course, we saw the court case with Dominion and Fox News, and they could only really get Fox News for uh, defamation because they had aired it on the television rather than just passing information online. And there is something about the way our policies are structured around social media that does give a pass uh, to groups who would use that social media for um, bad intents. And I think what's important here is social media companies need to figure out, well, what's, what is the apparatus that's going to not allow these disinformation campaigns to be so lucrative and to scale. Remember that Trump made tens of millions of dollars raising money for the insurrection, for the kind of legal campaign he was going to have to mount. Um, and that included all kinds of other fundraising done by Steve Bannon and, and Roger Stone, as well as Rudy Giuliani. And so these people were banking millions as the rest of us were watching in horror what was happening. Let's go to this uh, question someone has typed in. What should the role of elementary and secondary schools, which educate students for 12 years, what should their role be? And why do you think there are so many experts and researchers ignoring the role of K through 12 education? Um, do, do, can I get a shot at this one? I mean, K through 12 education is important. Um, and there are many countries that do a better job than the United States does of uh, recognizing fake news, you know, being good uh, literacy, you know, in, in all its aspects. Finland has a wonderful curriculum where they teach uh, elementary school students, you know, how to spot disinformation, how to, you know, be skeptical readers, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the problem. We can't wait for the kids to grow up to save us. It is important to do more for K through 12. It's also important for adults. I mean, you, you can't presume that even the adults have the skills to mm -hmm. do this, which I think the last few years have shown. And, you know, there are folks who are um, working on this. Uh, my friend Andy Norman has a book called Mental Immunity, in which he's outlined a program by which you know uh, adults can learn how to be better reasoners uh about this time to fight their own cognitive bias so you know there are things that people can do i have to say i think that we need it has to be both and we need to do more we need to do a better job of educating children we need to do a better job of educating adults but we also need to figure out how to stop the amplification of disinformation. That is what is, I think, going to be the tipping point in this. In my book, the, you know, the backbone of the, the chapters, one is the creators of disinformation. Another is the amplifiers of disinformation, which would be you know, social media and cable news, et cetera. And then the believers. And I look at that as a pipeline. You can't get the creators of disinformation to stop creating it because they're benefiting by it why would they and sometimes they live in foreign countries you know you pass a law here it's not going to make a difference sadly it's also true that once someone believes once someone is exposed to disinformation 
you know, a certain percentage of the population is simply going to believe it. And once someone believes something, it's very hard to convince them to give it up. Um, we've seen this with science denial. We've seen it, you know, we've seen this before. People, once they get dug in on a belief, it can become part of their identity. And it's very hard to, to you can't debunk your way out of an infodemic. I think that the pinch point in all this is amplification. I think we have to figure out how to keep the um, social media companies and the cable news uh, uh, outlets like, like Fox that are uh, you know outright lying to the population, uh, how to hold them more accountable. Um, the, the tragedy that I see these days is, and, and Joan, I, I know you see this too, social media. They're doing less now than they were doing a few years ago. The, the, the threat is greater, but I was just reading about how, you know, now Elon Musk has fired or has dissolved his entire trust and security team. He's now got, what does he call it? Community notes. He's outsourced, um, you know, what used to be content moderation to the community. He's crowd crowdsourced it, which is just, you know, a magnet for disinformers, for trolls to, you know, take over. And I mean, that, crowdsourcing can work it you know it works at wikipedia mm -hmm. but it is right now uh you know uh, far less than we need on twitter um facebook uh you know i, I should say a meta the, the parent company recently dissolved their i think with what did they they call it their their innovation and reliability team or it was the one that was uh i, I can't remember what it was called but they were uh, examining the the risks of their behavior, you know, what, what they were doing. They've dissolved that. So, I mean, the, the other social media companies are looking at what's happening at Twitter and saying, oh, you know, the bar is kind of low. We maybe don't have to do as much as we did. Uh, and they're not. And we're all suffering for this. And uh, I, you know, I think, look, we can't wait for the kids to save us. We can't wait for the social media companies to save us. We can't wait for the government to save us. One reason that I wrote my book is because I'm advocating a grassroots revolution where we can save ourselves. We have to try, um, uh, to, you know, in the uh, realize that we're in a disinformation war. And at the end of my book, I outline 10 steps that we can all take to try to do that on an individual basis, because I just I don't see any other cavalry coming over the hill. Uh Joan, before you talk about talk, which is your mm -hmm. idea, T-A-L-K, um, one thing that surprised me is, is you said only 5% of the population switches its political affiliation in their lifetime, 5%, mm -hmm. which makes you wonder why people are spending so much money trying to convert them. But then you emphasize the more worrying trend is that the right wing try and convince people that voting is a total waste of time. That doesn't matter. So they diss democracy, which feeds anarchy, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we saw this very clearly in the 2020 election. There was a big Republican push not to vote by mail. And this was the pretexting to set up a very elaborate lie that vote by mail was somehow corrupt. And that there were truckfuls of ballots that were thrown in the river and truckfuls of ballots that were hidden in different areas and, and were, um, you know, was the subject of a very controversial documentary called 2000 Mules that was propagated on the right wing. But what's important here is that telling people not to vote, telling people that voting is useless, telling people that it's going to be rigged anyway, doesn't set them up to have a unified national spirit. So one of the things that uh, our democracy has really relied on is this peaceful passing of power through elections. And we've almost taken for granted that that process is going to play out fairly and that people are going to act rational when the time comes. Trump was acting so irrational and suggesting a kind of collaboration on the scale of uh, I mean, they claimed communist algorithms from Venezuela were hacking the 
the machines, right? Uh, the Dominion voting machines and whatnot. So it was an international scandal, but nobody had any evidence anywhere that this was coordinated, right? It was um, even Rudy Giuliani's spectacle of 60 court cases uh, was about convincing this public that they needed to fight for freedom, that, the, you know, the meme 1776 rises or 17, it's 1776. This was something that was popularized by Alex Jones on Infowars. But then we had sitting members of Congress tweeting it uh, in the lead up to January 6th. And this idea that democracy is so at risk that you are going to do anything to take it mm. back, right? That's what Trump convinced people of. And they went for it. Um, several thousand people went for it. And I think what's important here to understand is that when a politician is using social media, even though the tool is the same tool that Lee and I would use or you, Mary, or anyone on this call, it functions differently. Twitter functions differently when you are the president of the United States of America. It's different for you because you have, you know, 10, tens of millions of adoring fans and you could just as easily announce that a war out of all against all uh, needs to happen. And if you're the president, people are going to listen to you and they're going to think, well, the president has declared a war of all against all. I should batten down the hatches and get my guns, right? So what happened on January 6th was such a failure to imagine how Trump was going to try to steal democracy. And what's unfortunate is that even today, we're still debating with sitting members of Congress that this election was stolen. And that, to me, is some of the most dangerous rhetoric that we can have in a democracy, because people are going to become less and less invoted, invested in the voting system. They're going to become more invested in their own survival and the survival of their kinfolk and the survival of their party. And the U.S. is, a, an, again, a very different nation in the sense that we have a lot of guns and people are not, uh, people are becoming more and more interested in vigilante type justice. And we can't divorce what happened on January 6th from other events that have happened um, in our recent history where people, particularly white people, have taken it upon themselves to take the law into their own hands and so and in the u.s has a very rich history of vigilantism as well and so i what i hope is that that spirit within america does not awaken um and turn into uh, a mass civil war but i i wouldn't rule it out at this point um unfortunately because of the way in which People are so deluded about, you know, take the rumors about Biden. He's either a feeble old man or dark Brandon, diabolical world leader controlling all the banks, right? It doesn't make any sense. But you can believe either one of those and use it as a reason to um, revolt. Somebody's written a question here, which I think is is a very valid one. Um, before we were talking about how, you know, the right use the Internet freely. They know how to distribute information fastly. Um, and we don't seem well, the center and the left do not. Con they don't. The truth aspect of paid media can't seem to compensate for that. So there's a paywall on lots of really good sources like the New York Times and the Washington Post, you can't forward an article without paying. And that seems to encumber this. And the person asks, do you have a suggestion on how to combat the spread of disinformation, 
in an ecosystem where true, accurate, well-researched reporting is often encumbered by a paywall and lies are freely and widely distributed. Well, okay. I'll, t I'll take this one just real quick in the sense that you have to imagine, and I've met plenty of news executives, journalism is a business. And it's not the business of truth. Journalism is the business of selling ads and news is the vehicle for that. Most people want news every day, but they don't want politics every day. But what the right has been able to do is infuse news and piggyback politics on, with it. And so if you watch right wing media, they are fully equipped to live in an algorithmically edi edited world because they share each other's content. They share similar narratives. Many of the narratives never show up on the left or in center media that show up on right wing media. And then they can point to it and say they are not even going to report on this. And I urge you to think about right wing media as party with news. And I urge you to think about mainstream or center media as business. Um, I would like to believe that journalists will get the truth out at any cost, but that's not true. The cost is usually a couple bucks a month for a subscription. And this is, all has to do with the business model of platforms, which is that if you're an advertiser, you want your ads to be on the front page of Google, in people's social media feeds, and surrounding YouTube videos. Um, but having your ads be downstream in the Detroit Free Press essentially means that you're going to reach very little people, very few people with your advertising. And so the structure of advertising has changed, thus changing the business model of news media. And that impediment to needing to fund your journalism, requiring subscription fees really aids those that are working on behalf of the party and are giving news mm -hmm. as a vehicle for indoctrination. There, there is a way to fight back though. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, like, oh, so I'll add to the list. We can't count on the journalists to save us either, but they're, but we need them when we need them to do a better job and to you know adhere by good journalistic standards wherever possible to to forward the truth but there there is a way to fight back and you know as part of the research for my book i interviewed counterterrorism officials army officials you know pe people who were in the business of fighting disinformation uh, government to government or you know army to army foreign disinformation now the problem in the United States is foreign disinformation. You often see Russian disinformation, for instance, they try to filter it as quickly as possible through domestic sources. They try to launder it, you know, get that RT story on Fox as quickly as they can, because then it is untouchable, uh, you know, based on constitutional safeguards from, you know, United States owned cyber warriors. So, you know, but I wanted to know what we could learn from them. And there are some very easy principles, some of which I talk about a little bit in the book. One is say the truth over and over. The repetition effect works. I mean, we watch Trump lie over and over. Why does he keep repeating the same slogans and the same lies? And the answer is because it works. So one way to fight back against you know, what we've been talking about is to tell the truth and to tell it over and over again. And another uh, tip that I got from somebody who was a counterterrorism -ter official is that you need a an ambassador. You need it, my, the way dog's shaking over there. You need an ambassador for truth. You need somebody who will go to your target audience. You know, you, you need to find somebody who is maybe from the community that you're trying to convince and not just, you know, present uh, the information that you want to find somebody who's an influencer. So, you know, there, there are techniques and, and I, uh, th that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I, I outline a few more, but you know, there, there are things that we could be doing that we're not doing. And I'm talking now about 
citizens who care about this because the the thing that i guess most concerns me is that ultimately people are going to give up on the idea of truth they're going to say i don't believe anyone i mean like you you said earlier right you watch the news you're not sure who to believe because one of the goals of disinformation i think is to make you um cynical that you don't think that truth can be had and what happens next is you begin to feel helpless, like you don't know how to fight back. I wrote my book because you're not helpless. There are things that you can do to fight back. It's just that we're waiting for someone else to save us, or we don't know what the things are. Uh, we don't know that we're being lied to. The, the most important principle the, you know, of the, the 10 things you can do to fight back against disinformation, the number one that I talk about in my book is that you cannot win a disinformation war until you realize that you're in one. So just, you know, understanding that we are in a disinformation war and have been for some time is the first step that people need to make before, you know, they can learn how to fight back. I, I just, I, a lot of journalists, unfortunately, don't seem to acknowledge this, but I've been trying to get the word out, and I know many other people have too, that this is a problem. It could lead to the downfall of democracy, as Joan said in her testimony before Congress. We're running out of time, but there are things that we can do before the 2024 election and have to do because Trump has already announced his second term agenda, and it involves gutting the, the civil service and you know putting in loyalists and weaponizing the Department of Justice and the IRS. That could be game over for democracy in the United States, I'm afraid. That's very, very, very profound um, words. So I think that it's it's that important. It's that serious. Um, we're almost out of time. We are out of time. But I'm going to go back to Joan just to let you have this last word about creating a more robust, diverse sphere of uh, information on social media with talk. So yeah, tell us a little bit. Yeah. So talk stands for timely, accurate local knowledge of which journalism is knowledge, I, because there are methods, there are investigative tactics. It has, uh, it, you know, you can corroborate it, you can check sources, uh, but it's not the only kind of knowledge out there. And I think that the early promise of the internet was a, a robust public sphere where anyone could make a website and you know, have a server in their house and and keep it online. Oh, that's my cat. And um, but where we're at now is that we need more and better ways of assessing information online. We need uh, more reputable sources, especially health sources, health news, um, and we need to have long-term investigative journalists that will uh, hold the line and keep people in power accountable. One of the things that's really important about our conversation here today is that disinformation research is about holding the powerful to account. And we wouldn't be doing a good job if the owners and purveyors of disinformation didn't hate us. Uh, including billionaire CEOs and government officials, because what we're doing isn't towing the party line. It's not reprinting press releases. It's not throwing our hands up and saying, who can know the truth? We're saying truth needs an advocate. Truth needs to be free. And one of the ways that we can do this is to harness the power of talk, timely, accurate local knowledge, and find ways of reaching more local communities. And my hope for the future of a public interest internet is that we use AI as a tool to wrangle local information and to help it flourish and to help it become discoverable online so that we do have a robust public sphere where we are in touch with people in their location. And that's my hope for the future of the internet. I'm not so much as a pessimist as my research might su suggest. I do believe there are good people in this world who want the same things as many of us. 
And I do believe there's a lot more of us than there are disinformers yes. and media manipulators. Yes. And so holding the repeat offenders to account through demonetization and deplatforming yes. is another viable strategy. And if you read the um, op-ed I wrote in Time this week that I put in the chat, um, at the end of it, there's five uh, things that you can do to check the veracity of information online that me and my colleague, Amanda, um, Amelia Acker, had come up with. So thank you, Mary, so much. And thank you, Lee, for the conversation. No, thank you both. Sure. We don't go till we've just sure. closed, just so we finish off. Uh, that chat link will be in the in the Q&A there um, so that people can see the link to time. Um, and also last week's program was a very good rendition or reinforcement of what you're saying, which is local voting activity. People's desire, their interest in voting is directly related to their local news. So that was what we were discussing, discussing last week. It's very important that you have local news you can trust because that's how you base your decisions and your voting behavior. Okay, so thank you so much, Lee McIntyre, Joan Donovan, both from Boston University for sharing your time and insight. And both books are really worth a read. If you can't buy them, then order them from the library so everyone can read them. Um, thanks everyone online as well for joining us. So Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, Mass Cultural Council, Cambridge Community Foundation, and of course, all of you. Uh, spread the word and donate. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>